So welcome everyone to Miller Thompson's Toronto office. I'm Lisa Abbey Oldenburg. I'm one of the speakers and I'm also your host this evening. I'm going to be giving you a, a brief introduction first to our firm and also to our speakers tonight. Um, just so that you know, there, there will be a networking event or session after the seminar. So we've got wine set up in the back and uh, I hope you will stay. And we'll also have a question and answer period at the end as well. Um, and before I forget, uh, in your materials, in your handout materials, there is a feedback card, which I hope you will complete and drop it off in the basket out at the front reception desk on your way out. And also, if you're not on our Miller Thompson mailing list, um, and if you want to receive more invitations like this one to seminars or to some of our free legal publications, we need your castle consent. So there's a little card that's in the materials as well. It gives you um, the address to our website where you can send an email to consent at millerthompson.com and then you can receive more of our uh, invites in the, in the future. And of course, you can unsubscribe at any time. So about um, Miller Thompson, we're a national full service law firm, for those of you who don't know us. Uh, we have 480 lawyers in offices from Vancouver, Calgary, Edmonton, Saskatchewan, Regina to London, Kitchener, Waterloo, Guelph, Toronto, Markham and Montreal. And in the handout materials, you'll also find some information about our practice areas, and we can certainly help you with all of your business legal needs, everything from contracts and intellectual property to litigation, immigration, employment law, whatever, whatever it is that you require. My practice is in the area of technology law, and basically what I do is I help clients with the purchase, sale, licensing, use and protection of their technology assets, whether it's software, hardware, data or IT services. The clients I represent are in all industry sectors, so everywhere, everyone from software and hardware manufacturers or developers to e-commerce companies to airlines. I've done work for healthcare organizations, transportation companies, telecom companies, retail sector, industry participants, uh, power generation firms, and of course financial services. My co-presenters who are sitting over there, the lovely ladies, are Catherine Dennis Brooks and Dr. Karen Durrell. And Catherine is an IP lawyer here at Miller Thompson who focuses on trademarks, marketing, and advertising. And she assists clients with all their domestic and international trademark portfolios, everything from registrations to licensing to dealing with oppositions, cancellations, and enforcements. And she appears regularly before various courts and tribunals. And Dr. Karen Durrell, who's at the end there, is also an intellectual property lawyer and a registered patent agent. And her focus is on software, IT and mechanical innovation. She's very experienced with tech transfer and also she can help you conduct IP audits and do your intellectual property due diligence. So thank you both for, for doing your presentations and before we start I would like to also introduce Jeff. Jeff Nestel is the president of KIPP and he's going to give us an overview of Canada's Association of Information Technology Professionals. And if you work in the IT area, and if you're not a member of KIPS, I highly recommend that you, you do join, because it's a great organization. So Jeff, if you wouldn't mind coming up. So uh, KIPS, KIPS has been around for a long time. Uh, some people in the room I, I know know KIPS very, very well, and uh, some people it's probably new. Uh, KIPS was founded in 1958. Uh, we're just a little few years shy of 60 years, an organization which in IT is a long, long time, can tell right away because our logo is a uh, core memory element when memory used to be bounded by iron rings around electrical current in order to, to store a one or a zero. So, I mean, KIPS is a professional society, so it is less formal but uh, not uh, totally dissimilar to the Law Society of Upper Canada, for example. It's a, it's a association for professionals. Uh, IT is not a regulated profession. It's not 
profession where um, requires license in any way, but we do uh, are attempting to develop an identity in the IT profession because all of true professions begin with just that. People self-identify as, as being uh, members of the, uh, of the profession. So, I mean, we, ha we provide membership. We have a certification, which is recognized by provincial statute in a number of provinces, including Ontario, the ISP, uh, Information Systems Professional, uh, and we also have accreditation, the ITCP, which was uh, developed out of a, a UN subcommittee, um, the P3P. So this is a global skill standards that uh, uh, was set up by a UN subcommittee. Um, and we provide offer opportunities to network, uh, develop your career in the technology sector. Um, we have opportunities to uh, enhance your business. Fortunate to be able to have information about uh, mergers and acquisition opportunities and other such things and a place where you can raise your, your uh, personal and company profile. So uh, that's KIPS in a nutshell. Info at KIPS.ca is the email to go to, and we are the uh, only professional information technology designation that's not vendor-specific and that's, that's recognized uh, by, by statute. So uh, thanks very much. Excellent. OK, so we're going to be discussing this evening what you need to know about owning your intellectual property. I'm going to give you a really brief introduction to IP law and we're going to dive right into some problem scenarios that have come up with a variety of our clients and we hope that this will be informative and it will help to help you to prevent uh, getting into those types of situations. I'm going to talk about copyrights, um, Catherine's going to discuss trademarks and Karen's going to cover off patents and at the end we'll have a Q&A session. So just to um, give you the highlights, intellectual property or IP is a term which describes many types of intangible rights which can coexist in the same thing or process. And what's important to note is that the statutory rights differ in each country. So just because you have registrations or you may have intellectual property in Canada it doesn't necessarily mean you're protected in every other country in the world. So you have to really know where you're doing business and which statutes apply because every country has its own statutes and those statutes specify the specific rights, the specific bundle of rights that the owner gets. In Canada we have the Copyright Act, the Trademarks Act and the Patent Act, but there are other statutory IP as well. We have industrial designs, integrated circuit topography, plant breeders rights as an example. And then there's also rights that could arise at common law, which means you don't actually have a statute that governs them, such as trade secrets, which could be created through a duty that is owed between two parties with respect to confidentiality or under a contract. And also under our Trademarks Act, there is reference as well to common law trademark rights, which can exist, and uh, Catherine's going to talk about that. The key point to remember is that each type of intellectual property, as I said, comes with a bundle of rights. It's not just one. It's not like you get one copyright or one patent right. And we'll, we'll talk about in a second what those are. So anyone who is creating or hiring someone to create something for them, or purchases, or sells, distributes, licenses, or uses, or exercises the intellectual property, really needs to understand who owns it, what, what are the specific rights they have, and what they don't. Because if you don't, if you're a purchaser or a user of someone else's intellectual property, and you don't have all the rights that you need, you could be in trouble and be at risk for an infringement claim, which could also result in, of course, serious damages. And sometimes you will also, you may have an existing license, but it might not be broad enough to cover the scope of what you need. And then, of course, <coughs> the licensor is going to ask for more fees or more royalties. If you're on the, the developer side or the seller side, or, and you're licensing technology, you could also be giving away too much. So there could be, if you're, if you're not very careful about the specific rights that you're dealing with in your transactions, 
um, there might be money that's left on the table that you could have got more for if you had created a much narrower scope of rights being granted to your customers. So you have to make sure you, you're very careful that you clarify what the IP rights are. So speaking about copyright problems, some of the common things I've seen, and this, is, this comes up over and over and over again, is you will get somebody who has copyright in something, and that could be software, it could be any original literary, dramatic, musical, or artistic work. And they give someone else a license to use it. The question is, what does that mean? Because if you go to our statute, the Copyright Act, there is no such thing as a right to use under the Act. The Act specifically has a set of enumerated rights. So this is what copyrights are. The right to produce, the right to reproduce or copy, the right to perform, the right to publish, translate, communicate by telecommunication, and also for computer programs to rent. So that's the example of the bundle of rights that you could have under the Copyright Act. So as a copyright owner or developer or creator, which of those rights do you want to keep? Which ones do you want to give away? You know, you have to make sure you're very clear and explicit. If you just give someone a right to use, it's confusing and you're going to end up pretty much in litigation at some point. Then, on top of that, in addition to the statutory rights, we can dissect your rights by scope. So we could divide up all those individual rights by territory, by a line of business, by a product, by an equipment. Is it online or is it electronic um, versus a hard copy right? Is it by volume? How many, how many uh, people can actually exercise those rights? Like a number of users that could make a number of copies. For how long? What's the duration? Is it worldwide? Is it an unlimited license? And is it perpetual? What's the term? So you can see how just, just giving someone a license to use something is very meaningless. We, it doesn't answer any of those questions. And you have to also remember, as I said, in every country there's a different statute. So in every country there may be different rights. So if you are doing business outside of Canada, we have to look at the relevant statutes in those other countries to see if those rights are covered or not and what specific wording you have to put into your contract. Second common problem, seen this a few times, people hire developers or creators to create works for them, copyright works. They pay for it, they sign a contract and they think they own it. Well guess what? You don't necessarily own it. And especially in Canada, if many of you may be familiar with a work for hire rule that's in the United States that when you, under US copyright law, if you pay somebody, if you hire someone and pay them for their work, that you end up owning it. But in Canada, under our Copyright Act, we don't have that rule. So in Canada, you have to have an express written assignment, assigning all or maybe only some of the rights, depending on what you want. But if you want to own everything, you have to get a full assignment of all the rights. Under our statute, the works are first owned by the author. So whoever created it is the owner, unless they're an employee and they did it in the course of their employment. There are some exceptions. But that's the general rule. So if you are hiring subcontractors, freelancers, make sure all of those agreements contain written assignments and that you're very clear as to what rights are being assigned and transferred. Otherwise, all you have is an implied license, and we don't know what the scope of that could be. I'd like to try to keep them to the end, but if it's, if it's really well, it's just that we'll meet any urgent. We'll yeah, sure, the go ahead. So the question was, the, the work for hire rule in Canada, I want to understand mm -hmm. 
how the um, how the definition of where that rule would apply. For example, if the company is domiciled in the United States and you're actually mm -hmm. here <coughs> working for that company in the United States, which law would apply? It's a very good question. So which law ends up applying? Well, you're going to have to look at where the work is actually created and who the authors of the work are. Where are they located? And where are they? Where where was the work created? Um, it's a good question, but it's it's a concept which is under the U.S. law. So if it's if it's created in the U.S. by U.S. citizens, you're going to end up being governed by U.S. law. But if it's created here in Canada, then the Canadian copyright law is going to apply. Even if the even if the contract is correct. with a U.S. company, that's correct. That's, US law will apply and I find it that's, a, that's the law of the contract, but that's not the law that governs the actual creation of the intellectual property. <coughs> right? Yeah. So if you don't have an assignment, you could just be... You're, you might be lucky that you're just getting an implied license because they did create something for you and you paid for that and you, you know, they gave it to you so they implicitly gave you a license. But what is the scope of your license? Can you resell it? Can you further sub-license it? Probably not. Scenario number three, and this gets into the whole assignment and transferability question, um, you, your, your business is either buying or selling intellectual property in the form of a license agreement uh, from some other third party. So the license, so in other words, you get a license from somebody and it doesn't expressly say whether it is transferable or sub-licensable. It just says, you know, you're giving, getting a license to reproduce, copy, whatever, all, all that kind of stuff. Now, you need to take that intellectual property and give it to someone else. You may need to sell it, or you may need to give it to a customer, or you may need to give it to a service provider, an outsourcer. Are you allowed to do that? The courts have said in Canada that copyright licenses are personal. They're personal to the licensee. When a licensor grants a license, you have to have express permission from them to transfer or assign, or assign it. If the license agreement is silent, it doesn't mean it's automatically assignable. So this is different from corporate law. Most of you who have seen commercial agreements and done commercial M&A deals, when you do your due diligence, you'll have contracts, and the contracts if they don't expressly say that they're not assignable or they're not transferable, you just assume they're transferable. But under intellectual property law, it's a different regime. So you cannot just assume that. You have to actually get the permission of the licensor to be able to transfer or sublicense the rights. And this leads down to another question, which is where, where it's going to come up, is when you're selling something to a, a third party, they're going to ask you, oh, did you have the right to give it to me? Did you have the right to transfer it to me? They're going to ask you for a representation or warranty that you had the right. You had the right to transfer it or license it. So you can't give a proper rep and warranty if you don't have those express permission. And also watch out for confidentiality restrictions because sometimes, even if, even if the license does permit you to assign or transfer or sublicense or distribute the intellectual property, the confidentiality agreements you have in place or the confidentiality <coughs> provisions of the contract may restrict you from disclosing it to anyone else. So you're basically caught. You might have, you might have a proper license to do something, but under the confidentiality provisions, you'd be breaching the contract if you disclosed it to someone else. So they have to be consistent, and I've seen that problem a few times where they're inconsistent terms. <coughs> the fourth scenario is <coughs> where there's problems often is when somebody tries to make changes and modify a copyright work, 
any of you remember the, have you seen the Canada geese that are flying in the Eaton Centre? The, you've all heard that case, right? So the geese were, it were a piece of art that were, was purchased by, I think, the, um, uh, the landlord or the owner of um, the Eaton Centre. And for Christmas, they thought it would be fun to put little red ribbons around the geese's neck, the goose's, geese's? The geese necks, <laughs> whatever, um, and they thought it would look cute, so they did that, and then they got sued by the by the artist for infringing his moral rights. So, what are moral rights? Moral rights are not the same thing as an assignment. Okay, so it's and they're not the same thing as the intellectual property rights that we were just talking about. Moral rights under the Act are the right to the integrity of the work, which basically means you can't change it. You have to maintain it. It has to maintain its integrity. The right to remain anonymous and the right to be associated with the work either by the creator's name or a pseudonym. So if you don't have a, an actual written waiver and this is different from an assignment, a waiver of moral rights from all the authors of the work, you cannot in the future make any changes. So, and the other problem that comes up is the waiver has to be broad enough that it covers all future owners or assignees or licensees if you want the ability to pass that on to your you know, customers or anybody down the chain that you may be transferring the intellectual property to in the future. And finally, the last scenario that I've seen as a main problem that people always, you know, again, get confused on is non-exclusive versus sole versus exclusive. I've seen contracts drafted, copyright licenses, where the company is receiving or is giving a non-exclusive sole license. What does that mean? It, it's completely confusing because there is a difference. So licenses could be granted either as exclusive licenses, which means it's to the exclusion of all others. So even the licensor themselves can no longer exercise that specific right that was granted. And they cannot further license to others that specific right that was granted. And it could be for a limited time period. It doesn't mean it's forever. It's how you draft the license. But it's, it's exclusive. It means you basically, as a licensee, you're getting a monopoly. If it's non-exclusive, it means the licensor can relicense it again, the same right over and over again as many times as they want, and they can also further license other people. So there's lots of competition. If it's a sole license, Sole means the licensor can keep those rights, can keep exercising those rights, but they will not grant further sublicenses to others. So the licensor could be competing with you as a licensee, but you won't at least have competition elsewhere in the market. So that's another thing just to watch out for in terms of wording of your, your copyright documents. And with that, I will turn it over to Catherine, who will give us some examples about trademarks and trademark problems. I'm going to cover common trademark problems that you should avoid. And first, I'm just going to clarify what a trademark is. It can be a word, a slogan, a design or symbol, or any combination of these things. And the function that a trademark serves is to distinguish your products and services from those of others in the marketplace. Here are some examples of trademarks that Miller Thompson uses. My first example of what to avoid is something that was recently in the news. Tesla Motors Inc., the company that produces electric cars, protected its trademarks first in the markets where it was first selling the cars. And selling cars in China, the largest car market in the world, was somewhere down, down farther on their list. So they didn't protect the mark Tesla right away in China. By the time they got around to it, they found that an entrepreneur there had already done it. He'd registered Tesla, waited for them to come to market in China, and hit them with a $4 million infringement suit. So this is an expensive example of what not to do. It's important 
to realize that trademark rights are generally national in scope. And so it's good to look forward and um, decide which markets you're going to be carrying business on in and apply for those marks. In this case, a settlement was ultimately reached. The trademark registrations were canceled and the registrant agreed to transfer domain names to, that he had also registered. But as you can imagine, it was probably a very expensive settlement. You can file your applications first in Canada if you're a Canadian company and you don't have to file in other jurisdictions right away. You've got a six-month window to file in the other jurisdictions after filing in Canada, but you can claim the earlier Canadian filed filing date. So that's a big benefit. The next example of what not to do involves a Yukon television ad campaign. The ad agency developed a, a TV campaign and a primary feature of it was a slogan, we'll leave a light on for you. As soon as the TV broadcast aired, the TV commercial aired, viewers started tweeting that this sounded really familiar and they figured out it was a trademark of Motel 6. Motel 6 had in fact registered a very similar trademark, one word difference, we'll leave the light on for you. They'd been using this mark for 30 years so the TV ad had to be taken down and the whole campaign was changed. It was on air only for three days. <coughs> Another expensive example of what not to do. And this highlights the importance of searching and clearing any new trademark that you're intending to use. The searches help identify any obstacles to use and registration and the potential for infringement actions. It's much better to know before you start investing in a brand whether it's worth investing in. So there are a number of different types of searches you can do to clear a trademark. In the Yukon case, they did, the, the ad agency who was responsible for searching and clearing the mark, they had just an identical hit search. So they went on the Canadian Intellectual Property Office website. There's a database there, it's free. Anyone can search a trademark, but it's very limited in scope. So they searched the mark, we'll leave a light on for you and it didn't turn up, we'll leave the light on for you. So it, it really reveals only identical or almost identical marks. The other option, which is much better, and I would highly recommend, is a full availability search. We can obtain from a search provider a full search of any marks you're thinking about using, and that will give us information not only about identical marks on the trademarks register, but confusingly similar marks on the trademarks register, marks used at common law through business name registrations, domain names, and marks used on the internet. It gives you a much better sense of what is out there and what obstacles you're likely to run into. When, we're, when you're working with ad agencies to develop your brand, it's important who's responsible for doing the searching and clearing of the trademark so that this doesn't slip through the cracks. It's a relatively inexpensive step that can help you avoid really costly mistakes. The third scenario I'd like to talk about is when your company has used a trademark for many years, do you have to register it? As Lisa mentioned earlier, there are common law rights in trademarks, which means you have rights in a trademark, even if you don't register it, just by virtue of the fact that you're using it. But those rights are limited in terms of the geographic scope to which you're using the mark and the extent to which you've managed to develop a reputation in the mark. So generally, it is always better to register your mark. There are many benefits associated with trademark registration, the most important of which is you get the exclusive right to use that mark as it's registered across Canada, not just in the geographic area where you're carrying on business. Secondly, registration grants you statutory causes of action that aren't available at common law. You can, your registration will prevent subsequently filed applications from registering. Fourthly, third parties will be put on notice that your mark exists, that it's a trademark, that you're using it as a trademark, and that you intend to enforce your rights. Because once it's on the trademarks register, it's a matter of public record. Anyone can search the CEPO database and see that you're using it. And lastly, there's a practical advantage in litigation. The certificate of registration for a trademark serves as evidence 
that you are the owner of that trademark and is a defense in an infringement action. So how do you go about protecting your trademark through registration? First, as we've discussed, you'll do the searching and clearing to ensure that it's not confusingly similar to any other marks that are being used or have been registered in Canada. And you should make sure that it complies with other requirements in the Trademarks Act um, that prohibit certain types of marks, such as names, their names, descriptively, sorry, deceptively descriptive marks, marks that describe the goods and services in association with which they're going to be used. And once you've cleared it for, for filing, um, we prepare a trademark application. It's filed with the trademarks office. The application is assigned to an examiner at the trademarks office. And after four or five months, we'll hear from the examiner. We'll either get an approval notice indicating that it's fine, or we'll get an examiner's report. The examiner's report will raise any technical issues with the application, indicating that it doesn't in some way comply with the Trademarks Act or the examiner might raise the issue of some confusingly similar marks on the register. We then have an opportunity to respond to the examiner, to file argument and try to persuade the examiner that it is compliant, or we have an option of amending the application to some extent to make it compliant. Once it's approved, it's advertised in the Trademarks Journal. The journal is published every Wednesday, and that's an opportunity for third parties to see what marks are close to registration, and if they have any objection to that mark registering, they have a two-month two window to object by filing a statement of opposition. If there's no opposition or if the opposition is overcome, the mark will be allowed and then registered. The whole process generally takes about a year, sometimes longer if there's complicated examiner's report or if there's an opposition proceeding. And the whole process takes it costs $1,500 to $2,000 if you don't run into any obstacles. So given the benefits that I highlighted, it's certainly well worth registering your marks. Registration is valid for 15 years and can be renewed after that. Next year, when the new um, amended Trademarks Act comes into force, that registration period will be reduced to 10 years. And the last scenario I'd like to cover for you is what if your company stops using a trademark that it registered previously? Will you lose your rights in that mark? You might. The key to trademark rights is to continue to use the trademark as it's registered. If you change the mark in some way or if you adopt a brand new mark, it's possible three years after registration that your registration will be challenged on the basis that it's not in use. You might get a notice from the Registrar of Trademarks asking you to provide evidence that you have been using it within the last three years, and if you can't do that, your registration will be expunged. So it's important to continue to use your marks as they're registered, or if you vary them or adopt new ones, file new, new applications. And the last thing that I'd point out in terms of protecting your trademark is, firstly, you should always distinguish your trademark from the rest of the text, whether it's in print. Um, and the way you can do this is putting it in capital letters or using a bold font. But you should somehow distinguish it from the rest of the text so anyone reading it will recognize, oh, this is a trademark. If it's an unregistered trademark, you should use the TM symbol. If it's a registered trademark, you should use the circle R symbol. And you should always have a trademark ownership notice indicating that you are the owner of the trademark where the mark is licensed by you for someone else to use, you should also indicate that it's used under license in your trademark notice. And I'll pass it over to Karen to talk to you about common patent problems. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to switch over now and talk about patents. And um, just as has been mentioned with the other types of IP that we've talked about, there are specific rules guiding patents, and also patents are to protect a specific type of intangible good. So patents are specifically to protect inventions. So inventions can be methods, they can be processes, they can be apparatus, um, and you can protect the elements that make up the invention and the way that these fit together, as well as the function of the invention itself. 
So um, patents can cover a fairly broad area of inventive activity. Um, but one thing to remember about patents, which is the same as the other IP that we've already talked about, is that there is a patent act in Canada that governs patent law in Canada. And it is not identical to the patent laws that are throughout the rest of the world and in other countries. And so what I find as a patent agent that often happens is people look to patent in the U.S. because the U.S. is one of the biggest markets. And they don't recognize that there are differences between the way patents work in Canada and the way that patents work in the U.S. and the way that patents work in some other countries. So we're going to touch on some of those differences as we go through the scenarios that I'm going to talk to you about today. Um, but I just um, like to start off with this slide because it sets out some of the uh, aspects of, ca of Canadian patent law. One is that the first owner of a patent is always going to be the inventor. So it might be one inventor or it might be co-inventors who brought their ideas together to create the invention. They will be the first owners at law. What they're given is an exclusive right, privilege, and liberty of making, constructing, and using the invention and selling it to others to be used. So as Lisa discussed, that's the bundle of rights that go along with patents, and each IP has its own bundle of rights. Um, there are criteria to figure out whether your invention is actually going to be patentable because we come up with tons of inventions every day, but not all of them are going to be granted patent rights. So in Canada, the rules are, first, it has to be patentable subject matter. And again, that's one of the areas that we differ under Canadian law from some other countries. For instance, Canada, you can't patent a game. You can in the US. So there's some differences. Canada, we can't patent higher life forms. There's a little bit of ambiguity about that because of some Supreme Court ruling, but pretty much you can't, if you clone a human, you probably can't patent that human that you've cloned. Um, other countries get closer to being able to patent, um, clearly patent higher life forms. So that's another difference between Canadian patent law and Canada's patent law in some other countries. So you just need to keep that in mind when you're thinking, can I patent this? Just because the answer is yes in another country doesn't mean it is yes in Canada. So that's the first hurdle you have to get over in Canada to patent, is, is it patentable subject matter? You then move on to three other criteria, which are pretty much standard across the world. First, is it novel? Which means, has this been done by anybody else anywhere else in the world previously? That's your rule for novelty. Second criteria is, well, I'm going to do them slightly out of order than I have them up there. Uh, second criteria is utility, which in Canada pretty much means does it work? These are your two criteria which are pretty clear. The third criteria is not so clear and that is, is it obvious? The test for obviousness is, has anyone else who is um, skilled in the same area of art as your invention, so not just Joe Blow off the street, but somebody who has some kind of a, a relative area of knowledge in your area of invention. When they look at your invention, would they say to themselves, no, I did not create this, but it's completely obvious to me to do so. And that's a really, really tough criteria because generally you file your patent application, it sits on an examiner's desk for a few years, they look at it, and by the time they look at it, your invention may be out there in the market and well-known. So now you've got to convince them that although it's, it's common knowledge to them now, the date you filed your patent application, it wasn't. It wasn't obvious on that date. So that can be your biggest hurdle when you're looking at patents in Canada. So let's get to some of the issues you might face. Okay. This is a common issue that my clients bring to me. They've gone to a conference. They've gone to a trade show, and they want to know what are their patent options now. So Canada and the U.S. have rules whereby you can make public disclosure of your invention, and the clock starts ticking. Twelve months from your public disclosure, you have to file your patent application in Canada or the U.S. But what my clients are often surprised to hear is that is not true across the world. There are many countries where they have absolute novelty rules, which means you cannot file a patent application after you've already disclosed your invention publicly. Now, there are a couple twists here. First is, the patent office is not going to ask you, 
did you publicly disclose this before you filed your patent application or did you do it 12, more, 12 months before you're filing in countries that allow for that? They're not going to ask you. So often what happens is you file your patent application, you go through the whole process of getting patent granted, which is long and <laughs> often quite expensive. You get your patent granted, you're very excited, you put it out there on the market, you're a huge success and everybody wants to knock you out of the way because you have rights from 20 years in that invention, exclusive rights, from the date you filed your patent application. So you've generally got a certain amount of time that you're going to be having a monopoly out there and people don't want you to have that monopoly. So what they do is they look into your past, find ways to knock out your patent and one of the ways is to find out that you disclosed either in Canada and the U.S more than 12 months before you filed or in countries that don't allow for any public disclosure, you disclose before you filed. So you want to be very, very careful when you come up with an invention and you're excited about it and you want to talk about it, um, be very, very careful. Think about where am I thinking that this is going to be marketable and if it's including countries that are absolute novelty, do not talk about it at all. The best rule is just don't talk about it at all. Um, unless you have the people who you're disclosing it to sign a non-disclosure agreement. And then the other thing I just want to mention, and I won't go into this in any great detail, but there are differences about what is public disclosure in various countries. Canada is very broad. It doesn't say it has to be written down or in any kind of tangible format, which some countries do. In Canada, it's just you publicly disclosed it. So it could be as little as you went to a dinner party and you talked about it. Technically, that potentially could be public disclosure if you didn't tell the people around the table that this is confidential, don't talk about it. Okay, so second scenario is when you are, when you have filed your patent application, there are certain things you have to do as you're going along the patent prosecution process. So you're going to have to pay maintenance fees as of the second year after your filing date. You have to pay them every year. You have to request examination within five years of filing your patent application. And you are likely to have an examiner give you a report, we call those office actions, that you have to respond to within a certain period of time. So you get your patent application filed and you forget to do one of these things. What happens? In Canada, your patent is going to be deemed abandoned upon the date that you forget to do, the, the, the due date to do one of these things. But what that means in Canada is that you have 12 months from the date that you didn't do what you were supposed to do. So the due date that your maintenance fee was not paid, you have 12 months to reinstate your patent application by filing a reinstatement request along with a reinstatement fee and doing what you missed doing. So if you didn't file your maintenance fee, you would have to file a reinstatement request within 12 months. You would have to put a fee in with that, and you would have to pay that maintenance fee that you didn't pay. So in Canada, it does not mean that your patent application is dead, but you have a period of time in which you have to fix that problem. Some other countries, they'll identify your application as being dead immediately, but you have a petition right, and that petition right doesn't really have a set period of time. Canada, 12 months. So kind of think of it like the grace period, 12 months, <laughs> as soon as you are either disclosing or you have missed something with your patent. Um, one of the reasons I raise this and a reason why I've got that little uh, administrative status off to the side is that this also comes up when you're doing due diligence, when you're, ha when you're in a transaction that involves patents, either you're purchasing patents or you're selling your patents. Um, you're not going to see a status necessarily that says your patent is deemed abandoned. So you're going to have to go and look into those dates. Is, there, is, is your patent filed more than five years ago? If so, is there a request for examination fee listed? When was your last maintenance fee paid? Was it paid on time? You're going to have to go and do a little bit more digging than in other countries. So it's something to keep in mind that you want somebody who knows the laws of a particular country doing your due diligence about patents in those countries because there are certain variations and little technical issues that if you have somebody who's used to another way another country works, they won't catch them necessarily. So something to keep in mind about patents. All right. 
So I have not used in this, in this instance an IP technology, partly because this one's nice and colorful and partly because I really like this technology. This is a tomato, but it's not just any tomato. This is a vaccine. It's a plant-derived vaccine tomato, and this was a hot technology a few years ago, and that's why I'm going to use it in this scenario. So a few years ago, many universities were working on plant-derived vaccines. You create a plant that has the vaccine in, you, you inject the vaccine or put the vaccine into the plant so that when the plant grows up and it creates fruit, you eat the tomato, it's the same as getting a shot in the arm. I really don't like needles, which is one reason I love this technology. So this technology being hot a few years ago, lots of people were trying to get to A, the market first, but B, the patent office first, right? Because you wanted to make sure that you were the one who were gonna get, was going to get rights. Now, first, there's a couple issues that arise with this competitors racing to the market scenario. Canada, we have a first to file system. That means the first person who files a patent application wins. Doesn't matter if you were working on it well before the person who got to the patent office first, you won't win just because you invented it first. And that is another area where we get a little bit of confusion with the US. The US until 2013 had laws whereby it was first to invent. They changed their laws and they're now first to file too. But what you want to keep in mind is I'm, I'm creating something great. I know I have competitors on my heels. I need to file first to be able to get the rights to this invention. Now, the tricky thing about that in the world of patents is that when you file a patent application, it's secret for the first 18 months after it's filed. Nobody can know about it. So when you go off and do a search, Catherine was talking about how, how helpful searches can be for trademarks, and they can be helpful for patents too, but they have a limitation because when you go and search, you have to realize you have a hole of 18 months before you're doing the search. You're not going to see anything that was filed then. And this is one reason I'm using this, this technology as an uh, example for this particular slide. In the, in the plant derived vaccine application world, we have three applications being filed there. They're the three that are listed. So one was filed on March 5th, 2012. One was filed on September 11th, 2012. And one was filed on December 17th, 2012. They would not know about the ones that happened before them because they weren't more than 18 months ago. So you know your competitors on your heels, but you can't know whether they filed before you unless they filed more than 18 months before you. So it's a little bit tricky in terms of judging where you're at in comparison to your, your competitors when you're thinking about when should I file. So in Canada, we have a sound prediction doctrine, which means you can file a patent application in Canada before you have done your absolute final testing to know that it is completely going to work. You have to have three criteria that you can answer yes to before you can make a filing when you're not 100% sure it can work. You have to have a factual basis to predict that it's going to work. At the filing date, the inventor has to have a sound line of reasoning from which the desired result can be inferred from the factual basis, so it's a little bit convoluted. And you have to have a proper disclosure in your patent application when you file. But on some instances, you can file before you have the final, final version. Um, but you have to be careful. So it's possible, but be careful. Um, this comes from a case, a Supreme Court case, in which AZT uh, was found to be quite helpful for AIDS, HIV, and they hadn't done their 100% final testing on the drug at the time when they filed the patent application, but they had done enough work on it and enough testing um, to have clinical trial research behind them that said, we have a good factual basis to say that we have a sound reasoning that this is actually going to be a workable invention, and they were allowed to get their patent application. Okay, so this takes us to scenario four, which is the patents were filed in the name of the inventors, but they should be owned by the company. And I see this a lot, and we're going to relate a little bit back to the, in, the applications we already talked, to, talked about in this particular scenario. So as we said up front, the first owner under the law of a patent is always going to be the inventor or inventors. 
And then what you have to do to find out who owns that patent is you have to file, follow through the chain of title. So considerations when you're trying to figure out who owns a patent is the inventors were first. Did the inventors themselves have any obligations to assign their rights over to somebody else? So for instance, employees, did they have an employee contract whereby they had to assign all of the inventions they created in the course of their employment over to the company that they work for, potentially? And students and university environments become really interesting because generally they are, they are governed by intellectual property policies of the particular institution where the student or the university professor comes from. In Canada, we do not have a standardized set of intellectual property policies for our institutions. So one institution may be saying in its IP policy, you've come up with an invention as part of your coursework student or in other work that you're doing as a student of our university, you get to own what you created. Other universities are going to say, you don't own it, the university owns it. So you, if you're working with students or you have students who are helping you with your inventions, keep in mind that there may be obligations on that student that they actually cannot own what they produce. And in terms of who is an inventor, it is anyone who had some inventive concept input. And the other thing about inventors is you need to list all of the inventors in your patent application. There can be um, detriments to you if you fail to list all of your inventors. And that comes back to the scenario we had before where you get your patent and somebody tries to attack your patent. This can be one of the reasons why they try and attack your patent because you didn't meet that kind of a requirement. And it's always heartbreaking to see people lose their patent rights over those kind of issues. So when you're, when you're creating an invention, keep in mind who's working on this, who actually has inventive concept input. Make sure they're all listed in your, as inventors. Um, and one reason I, I mentioned about the AZT case previously is because it's a good example of who's an inventor. Um, in that case, because the AZT drug had to be tested, um, it was sent out to be tested by people who that's all they did. They didn't give any input into it would be better if we had this adjunct added into it or if it was at this ratio. They didn't have any input into anything like that. All they did was test, did it work? They are not inventors. You have to have inventive concept input to be considered to be an inventor. Mm -hmm. In the an employer employee here relationship, mm -hmm. what sort of time frame is because you know, a lot of times people have these you know, great ideas and they you know and they're in a employee you know, uh, employer and they realize that if I disclose it you know here my employer's going to take you know what sort of and they leave, whether it be um, you know, or at a school, they leave the school and then disclose it. But the predominant you know, part of that work was done under the auspices of the, you know, the, the umbrella organization. What, where does that fall? And does, does the employer still really own the invention? Even um, though they disclosed it or they, you know, you know after they left. Yeah, so the date of invention when you are considered to be an inventor is not the date you disclose your invention, it's the date that you were actually coming up with your invention and working on your invention. So that would come back to if they were working on it as a student, potentially if they have an IP policy that says that they don't own things that they create while they're a student, then potentially the university has a, at least either full ownership of it or a cut into it. So that's why you need to be careful. And on, I like I like your question too because it brings up another important point. Um, you want to make sure that if you don't have a contract in place whereby somebody who's working with you um, through an IP policy or through a, a employee contract, you don't have a contract in place that says you're working on this. Yes, you're going to be an inventor, but you you're assigning it over to our company because our company wants to own this in the end. Um, if you don't have that in place, you are at risk of people wandering off into the ether, which we see happen as well, especially with students, right? Because they come in, they do a summer job, and then they're, they're off who knows where, and they're very difficult to locate when you need them to sign something. So keep in mind that if the company is supposed to own it, get the people who are working on it to assign their rights over to the company, even if you're not sure it's going to go far yet. But if they've had some kind of inventive concept input into something that could have potential, get them to sign the assignment now when you've got them in front of your face.
that's, that's just a good rule of thumb. Um, and so on the topic of the company should own, um, I go back to the two plant-derived, two of the plant-derived vaccine applications. Both of those were filed in 2012. You'll notice one is owned by the inventor, Ms. Professor Daniel. The other one, Professor Daniel was the inventor, but he assigned it over to the University of Central Florida. So this is a case that we see quite often that you have it on top of mind for one invention, but then you kind of let it slide for the next invention. Keep on top of the fact that inventions are happening and they're coming out of your institution and get them assigned to your institution if they should be assigned to your institution, just as a matter of course. And then I also bring up the beneficiary or estate of inventor uh, issue just because I've actually had that happen in the case where um, the company wanted to be the owner and we were in the middle of a transaction and as part of the transaction the inventor owner was supposed to assign as part of the closing of this transaction they would assign to the company, the company would assign to the company who was purchasing from them and unfortunately there was a death of one of the inventors who had not signed. It then went to his estate. The estate had to be put in place before the transaction could go forward. So, you know, there's all these things that can happen that are completely unforeseen. So as a rule of thumb, get your, get your assignments in line when you're actually working with the people and they're in front of you and, and they're, they're working on their inventions. Because it's just, if the company is supposed to own ultimately, it just makes things simpler and cleaner. And then the last thing I wanted to mention about assigning patents in Canada is there is an actual format that the assignment needs to be in to be acceptable for the patent office because when you assign your patent in Canada to a new owner, the new owner will not be recognized until you file your assignment with the patent office. So you need to make sure your assignment when you get it signed is in the right format and the format is not the same for all countries. So keep in mind what Canada needs when you get it signed because I have also had situations with clients when they bring in an assignment to be all signed, it, you know, the deal closed a few, couple months ago and they're now getting around to those post-deal activities. One of them is filing their assignments and you look at it and you say you're going to have to get the parties back together because this particular format won't work. And one of the things Canada needs is a witness or proof of ex execution by the assignor, which other countries don't necessarily need. Um, it means that the, sign, the person who signed, their signature needed to be witnessed. Um, and it also means generally what is, what is best is to have both the assignee and the assignor sign and have it witnessed. It's interesting in your comment at the very beginning on, on games, because yeah. Monopoly uh, has been in the press, somebody patented in the United States, and of course uh, it was invented by someone in England, and the person essentially copied wholesale thing, the patents in the United States. Um, but it's not a game, nothing but a process. I mean, maybe it's process and apparatus. But Canada, it, it, it disqualifies it on the basis that it's for entertainment? Or what, what makes something a game? So you couldn't patent, for instance, the rules to gin rummy. Right. Mm. But if you invented a new game. If you had a game like Mousetrap that you had just invented and it didn't exist before and it had all those intricate pieces and elements that go together, you may be able to, to patent the apparatus that makes it possible to play the game, but not the rules to play the game. Yeah, you run into this, this sort of um, distinction or slight line of distinction, especially in, in um, computerized uh, <coughs> poker and those kind of games, games that existed previously, um, now putting in a computerized environment, there has to be something more there. So you're saying that if, if uh, there was a, a modern board game, thing, mm -hmm. and they were patented in the United States, mm -hmm. and somebody took the rules wholesale, but invented a uh, cosmetically different apparatus or a different theme, if it was you know, based on a research or board game thing, that would not be patentable in Canada? And, and people could, could rip, I guess, off of games that existed in other countries as long as they didn't um, so, yeah, so if you created a game that had a specific type of board and you wanted to have protection for that in Canada, you could have, you could try to get protection depending on what the board looks like and that it's novel, it's non obvious, it's all of these different things. Um, but you would not get the same type of protection that you would get for that in the U.S. because you would be focused on the 
elements of it that are physical apparatus in Canada rather than the rules to play it, whereas in the U.S. you, you would have a larger latitude for what you'd be able to get a, a patent over. So yeah, there are slight differences from country to country, so you do want to keep that in mind when you're creating things, um, that just because you're seeking a patent and this is the way you're claiming it in one country doesn't mean you're going to be able to claim it the same way in all other countries depending on what area you work in. Yeah, no, absolutely. And and that's where that's where that's a nice way to introduce the fact that although we're standing up in front of you and talking about these different types of IP rights, they really do work together. And for instance, in the patenting world, people will come to me and say, I've come up with this idea, and perhaps it's not actually patentable, but if you brand it really well, so you use your trademark rights over it, and perhaps it, perhaps it has a software piece which is covered by, by copyright, you really want to think holistically about what do I have, what are all the IP rights that are possible in this, and how am I going to make those work together the best to protect this particular um, product or process or whatever it is that you have come up with. You don't want to just sort of think very narrow-mindedly about I'm only going to put all of my eggs in this one type of IP protection <coughs> basket. The earlier scenario about you trip over in this country. Mm -hmm. I'm just thinking Monsanto going around the world and blocking this and not know what the farmer is doing. Who is it green? Mm -hmm. How the heck did they get away with that type of thing? So Monsanto, in some countries, is able, a, a plant is considered to be a higher life form. So this is going to get a little bit technical. So a plant is considered to be a higher life form, and in some countries, you can get patent rights over higher life form. So Monsanto has been able to get both, a, a, and, and what their product really is, is a seed that has, it's, it's kind of like the, the plant-derived vaccine. It's a seed, but it's not in its natural format. It is, um, it, it, modified. yeah, it's modified so that when it grows, the plant that grows is actually going to um, reject certain types of sprays so that if you go out to your field and you spray generally, your good plants are going to continue to grow because they have protection built into them that allows them to continue to grow and all of the bad actual weeds will die. So it makes your spraying process much easier, but it is not grain that is grain that you trip over in the field. It is a modified, went into the lab, played around with it, came up with this, this, new, um, this new type of seed, which develops into a plant. Some countries will get a patent right over both the seed, which is genetically modified, and the plant that is the result of growing the seed. In Canada, you do not get rights over the plant as the plant, and this is where we get a little hairy in Canada, the Supreme Court said it is like Lego. So the plant is made up of cells that are genetically modified cells that are created through a laboratory process. So you can have rights for the cells that fit together like Lego to build the plant. You don't have rights over the plant, but you have rights over the pieces that build the plant. And pretty much when that decision came down, everyone went, what? <laughs> and we're still saying that because we have had no follow-up decision from the Supreme Court. But that's where we are in Canada. So the rule is still no higher life form patenting, but we've got this odd, all the pieces that go together to make the higher life form, we can have rights over those. So it's, it's, it's a little bit convoluted where we're at with that in Canada, but the rule is that, that that is a situation of a plant that has been genetically modified and therefore it has been created in a lab. It is not the same grain or canola that you would trip over in the field when it's natural grain or canola. Natural grain and canola can't have patent rights. I'm curious, uh, you mentioned that um, Uh, do they all have an equal financial interest 
or can they be classified as uh, have different interests? In the they all have an interest in the patent rights. And then if you want to split them out so that some inventors will have, the, the act does not separate by the amount of inventive input that you, concept input that you had, that this is the amount of the rights that you get in the final patent. So if you want to have that kind of an output, that's where you get into contractual agreements between the parties. Okay. Yeah. If I was sharing an idea in an office, mm -hmm. somebody gives an input, like in the He's going to come after you and say, you didn't name me, I'm an inventor, I have rights in this patent along with you, plus you did something wrong in front of the Patent Act. So that person would not want to go after your patent and have it uh, invalidated necessarily because that's bad for their economic interest. But they would definitely have a right to say, look, I am also an inventor and you forgot to name me. And the other thing in Canada is that you can leave off inventors only if they are missing persons, pretty much. And if they are missing persons, you have to show the patent office, if it comes out that you didn't name this person, then you have to show that you, you used your sort of best resources to try and find that person. So that's the other reason. Get them to sign up when they're in front of your face because if they go traipsing off, yes, you might be able to not list them, but you're going to have to have spent time and effort and money, which when you're trying to get an invention off the ground is just time and effort and money that you don't have. So, so just get the assignments if the company's supposed to own right up front. <laughs> yeah, if you name somebody who you shouldn't name, a lot of countries have a way that you can have an affidavit. That person will sign an affidavit and say, I was named as an inventor. I didn't actually have any inventive concept input. I should never have been named. Please remove me. So as far as the, uh, as far as the registration is concerned, it's going to be, uh, it's going to be a key. And the database is consists of nine plus other information that you would need to find that individual mm -hmm. that's in the package. Yeah, and in some countries they also have to sign, so they'll have their signature on file as well. So yeah, no, it's not it's not just that you submit these are the inventor's name. You in, you submit other information about the inventor. Okay. Quite kind of yeah. maybe for the reason why it would would be better. I mean, we, you had mentioned look and feel. Right? In a software world, like that was really big. You know, a number of years ago when um, Lotus came out with their and you know Lotus you know claimed it on all the other spreadsheets or, or many other spreadsheets that followed because they had the look and feel. They said, how does that work? Work now is like you know um, there's a I think that part of the thing with this Apple versus you know you know, you know Samsung is you know, especially when you be you know, a new GUI. You know, you know, comes up is everyone like this the look and how this uh, app you know, you know, looks and, and feels so people want similar and they want to you know, behave what sort of protection or how does that work? Well that whole concept is a, is a copyright law mm -hmm. concept so there is, it, it's been evolving mm -hmm. over time um, and actually do you know what
So oh, yes, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Is, is that the, you know, this one, what we're trying to say is one thing or one process or one whatever it is, a, a, a tangible object, um, could have multiple layers of intellectual property that exist in it. So yeah, going back to the plant, plant, um, the plant derived vaccine, it could have a patent, <coughs> it could have a trademark, you could give it a great name. Um, it could have publications and things that are written on it that are, that are protected by copyright. In Canada, it could have a plant breeder's right, per, perhaps. There are a whole bunch of different things that are in this one product. You have to decide where you want to go, where you think your target markets are, and how much money you think you're going to invest into the, the protection of it, and what's its value. And, but as a you know as a company you would you would think the more registrations you have the more valuable your company becomes those are assets those are recorded on your balance sheet and they're actually worth something and you know if you're looking to sell your company in the future or uh, do anything with it it's it's really important to have and just one thing I was gonna I, I forgot to mention because you talked about the trademark registrations little symbols and all that with trademarks it's you know you it's good to, to distinguish your mark by putting the little TM or the, um, the R if it's registered, but it, under copyright law, you don't actually have to do that. So you don't, in Canada, have to mark anything as C in the little circle. It's automatic that you, whoever was the, the author, was the, is the owner, the creator of the, of the work, other than the employer exception, which is different from the patents and the trademark side of things. So. You know, there are all these different nuances, and that's why it's good to, uh, you know, talk to one of us when you're dealing with any intellectual property that you have in your business or that you're developing um, to make sure you get all the protections you need so that you do, in fact, own what you think you own. And that's, I think, the, the bottom line of this, uh, this whole presentation. So on that note, um, we're going to wrap up and we'll have a little uh, reception area here happening in the back with some um, networking and a little bit of wine or drinks if anybody's interested in staying for a bit. And don't forget to drop off your little uh, cards with the evaluation form and sign up for our mailing lists if uh, you'd like to get more information in the future about other similar programs and publications that we put out. So thank you all for coming. Thanks.